Second Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, and I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a land to my feet, and a light into my path, and I will hide its word in my heart, that I might not sin against God. I pledge to the great I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prayer to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior who is the King of the Saints, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Okay, you may be seated. Ms. Carey, would you pray for our country? Um, pray for our leadership. I know with the election, just right around the corner, I pray that uh, people, before you hit the polls, just to uh, pray and just ask God for your guidance, um, that we get people in there that are um, spiritual, Bible-based, uh, Christian people that have good morals. Um, I pray that uh, people that just understand that we can't do this on our own that that it's not what we want it's what god wants us to have and what he demands us to do so would you pray for our country uh carrie um, would you pray for our churches would you pray for israel and as always just uh just just keep all of us in prayer as well heavenly father god we come to you today lord and we ask for your presence in this sanctuary lord we ask that you be glorified and that you would be pleased in our actions. Lord, I ask for um, your guidance for our country. We ask that uh, our, our governing uh, officials, Lord, would be seeking you. Lord, we pray for our president. We pray for all those who support him in the White House. We pray for all of those that trickle all the way down to the city council. Lord, I ask that they would seek you in the decisions that they make. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them as you see fit get started. Still looking for testimonies for the anniversary about what this church means to you in your walk. Uh, we're looking for two more. I've got one and then two more if anybody's willing to do that. Come see me. Don't forget to see you at the polls on the 25th at the schools. Special prayer service Sunday night 6 p.m. with community. It is John Kippur. It's the day of forgiveness. We're going to recognize um, our lives and how we need forgiveness and with what we've been doing with the Father, if there's anything that you need to clean out of your spiritual life, this is the service to do it in. We need sound room help. Um, Brother Barry is venturing out and doing some uh, pulpit filling and of course when Brother Barry goes we lose Miss Carrie and Jordan as well. So we need someone that are willing to train to take uh, some time into the sound room when they're gone. Uh, so if you want to do some training, just see Ms. Carrie about that. We would love all the help we can get. New members class, October 11th. You can see Brother Brent. He's the big guy in the blue shirt over there. There you go. See Brother Brent, if you want to attend the new members class, it'll take over Sunday school upstairs. Uh, they'll be teaching 
with Barry as well, simultaneously on the fundamentals of Christianity. And if you need to brush up on that, you really need to attend that class. Uh, if you're thinking about membership, it's another, it's another good time to attend that class. But if you don't know what you stand for, then you won't stand. Simple enough, right? If you don't know the fundamentals of your, your walk and who Jesus is, you'll fall. So this is a wonderful class. Um, we, we do it once a year, and, and more if we have to. So feel free to join in, see Brent, he'll give you the book. Um, he'll sign you up and get you started. It's a great day to serve Jesus, ain't it? Amen. Today's sermon entitled is called Tested. This is the final episode in the series of True Relationship. And I really, really hope that this has given you the tools to, pro to protect and to grow your relationship with God. An understanding of what God chooses and desires for you to have with Him. And also our thought processes and our changing of our minds so that we make sure that we guard that and strengthen our minds. So we're going to talk about when your walk is tested. When tested, <clears throat> some tend to run these questions through their minds. <clears throat> Why me, God? Why do I have to go through this? What have I done? I wonder, Lord, will you be with me <clears throat> when I need you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Can't get rid of the frog. <clears throat> if God really sufficient for your every aspect of life, is he truly all you need? <clears throat> all these questions generate doubt. And doubt blocks faith. A true, <coughs> excuse me, a true relationship is solid ground for you to build your relationship with God. These answers and more are answered today. Or these questions and more are answered today. Let me give you three points on being tested. The first point is, is that there is no promise of an easy walk. Some Christians get misunderstood when they become disciples of Jesus Christ and they don't, they don't get any training or discipleship. They seem to think once they've accepted Christ, then that's it. But really, it's just the beginning of your walk for a lifetime of serving your God. And there is no promise of an easy walk. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus tells us in Matthew that if they persecute me, how much more will they persecute you? He's warned us that our walk will not be an easy path. And here's an interesting note since we're talking about Job today. It might be Job's perfect walk is what gets him tested. So that puts it in mind that the stronger your relationship with God is, the more God can use you in more situations. Job chapter 1, we'll start at verse 1. It says, and we're, not, we're just going to hit the highlights. Feel free to read chapters 1 and 2. It says that Job was perfect in his relationship to God. What does that mean? Well, as you read it, you'll see that Job always put God first in his life. He gave sacrifices and worship. He always sought God, uh, redemption, grace. He was always thinking about God. There was never a time that Job did anything without seeking God first. His relationship was perfect. Then we see... He feared God. What does that mean? He, it means he had a high and holy concept of who God was. He set him apart. He made reverence to God. God was special. He was first in his life at all times. And Job was so 
understanding of that, he wanted to make sure every action that he took glorified God. He gave God a place of reverence. I wonder, do we do that? Do we give God a place of reverence in our life daily? Or is our life so busy that we hardly ever think about God and the actions that we take? If we were true to ourselves and you're walking this past week, how much time did you devote to God versus the time that you devoted to other things? That's what a true relationship is. A true relationship, one that has your heart, is one that is always on your mind. My wife is always on my mind. I pray for her while she's at work. I'm concerned about who she, her health and who she uh, is and what she's doing. My thought process is always in prayer for her because I have a relationship with her. It's that same kind of relationship that we need with God. But Job did that. And I will tell you this, Satan hated him because of it. He did not like the glory that Job in this walk was pointing to. And that tells me that worship and service to your God is spiritual warfare. You don't get to choose if you're in spiritual warfare. You already are. Accepting Christ is a duty that is a lifetime. It's a devotion. We need to dare to be devoted. So a snapshot of chapter 1, verse 6 on down, it says, Intelligent, responsible creatures whom God reported, or who reported to God shows us that God's busyness, He's all around. He's got messengers doing His thing that always report to Him. And Satan came, verse 7, shows us that Satan is accountable to God. He is not an all-power being. He is accountable to God. Satan has run over the earth. Satan's job or what his duty is on this earth in his eyes is to stop reverence to the Lord. Think about it. If you stop the reverence to God, if you take that specialness away, then you have believers that don't follow. You have believers whose relationship falters. You have believers whose faith drains and sinks. If there is no fear, respectable fear of your Lord, then there is no consequences to your actions. I knew when I was a kid, if I was going to do something, I always considered if Dad was going to take the whip to me. And that respectable fear stopped me from doing a lot of things that I, I really wanted to do. If we don't have that respectable fear in our lives daily, if there is no reverence towards God, if we don't make Him special every day in our life, then our relationship is a fragment of what it should be. Now, if He takes the reverence away from non-believers, then there's no attraction to become a believer. If He keeps their minds away from God, He keeps their heads filled with doubt, then He wins there as well. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 1 Peter 5, 8 says that Satan is a roaming lion looking for whom he may devour. This is what Satan does. And Job was a big thorn in his side. He was a burr under the saddle because Job's walk always pointed to God's glory. Now I'm sure you could not visit Job without thinking about God. His actions, his speak, what he does, his love for God, always pointed to who God was. Satan hated that. Verses 8 through 10. We see that Satan hated Job. Job had a hedge of protection around him. Now what does that mean? That means God was blessing him. 
And I'm here to tell you that I believe every believer has a hedge of protection around them. Because there's no way God would give something to one child and not to the rest. But it's us to maintain the power of that protection by serving our God. So let me give you three things. I know these three things are very important, so write these down and remember them. If you're going to talk about your walk, these are important that you understand, you wrestle with, and then you understand that you have to accept them in your lives. If you do that, you will not falter when tests come. Are y'all ready? Ready. Okay, first thing is, is that you have to believe that there's head of protection around you. You have to understand that God is the almighty being. Seems not. <clears throat> that hedge of protection gives us motivation to squash fear. Two, Satan can only get to us because God allows it. We see in the New Testament where Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, I'm praying for you because Satan looks to sift you like wheat. Which means that God was going to allow that. Why? Because Peter's walk needed to be stronger. He was not at a level in his relationship that would be successful in what God had for him next. So if you are tested, and let me say this on a side note, I think we, as believers we give Satan way too much credit. Something goes wrong in our life, you go, that's Satan, he's attacking you. We give him way too much credit. Satan can only attack you if God is allowing it. Remember that. And third, if God allows it to happen, then he has a purpose for it. And the end result will be the glory of God. So those three things is you have a hedge of protection to serve your God. Satan can only get through that when God allows it. And if God allows it, he has a purpose for it. Can you imagine if you repeat these three things when you're going through a big test or a big trial in your life? <clears throat> when it seems like the walls are closing in, you can barely breathe, your mind can't get off a, a problem that's going on in life, if you just say, Satan, you can only be bothering me because God is allowing you to bother me. And if he's allowing you to bother me, then there is a purpose for it. All I have to do is reflect the glory of God. There is no testimony without a test. The second point is that troubles sharpen our focus. Now, I know nobody wants to hear that. But isn't it true? Don't our minds get laser beam locked in, focused on a problem that's bothering us? It does. Every free moment that you have, your mind's thinking about the what ifs and play the what if. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What am I going to do if this happens? We're always plotting about what the next step's going to be. But if we can take that laser focus and say, God's in control. I have a hedge of protection around me. But God, if God's allowing this test, then there is a purpose for this test. If there is a purpose for this test, then we need to glorify God. It gets our attention. Verse 9, Satan suggests that Job's devotion to God depended upon his life circumstances. Now that was an accusation on Job. But it was a false accusation on Job. But it is a good question today. The question is, are you a fair weather Christian? A fair weather disciple? Can you walk only stand in the good times? Is your relationship only strong enough to praise God when you're up on the mountaintop? But when you get to the valley, we're not feeling like praising God. We're not drawing from that true relationship. We're not understanding that there is a purpose. We're not understanding that we must reflect the glory of God. Why? Because we're too busy looking at our shoes. <clears throat> Call them shoe shine Christians. Christians always looking down. Need I say 
no matter what happens in your life or what happens in this society, and you can turn on the TV for yourself, God's got this. He's in control. And everything happens for a purpose, a reason. We know Scripture. You know the book of Revelation. You can see the window in the Revelation right now. We know what things have to come to pass for this to be true. And we know God's word's going to be true. So God has this. He never forgets us in this world. But the question is, is, is your relationship prepared to handle what's coming in society today? What you're seeing is just the scratching of the surface of what's got to happen. Is your relationship prepared to stand for God when nobody else will? Verse 11, Satan touches all Job has because God allows it. All his materialistic things are gone. His loved ones are gone because God allows him to test Job. And we see in verse 12 that with what's going on, that God desires, God's desire is Job to be a trophy for God's grace. Even during all the suffering, his desire is for him to be the pole and lift up the glory of God. His desire in this world today is for his disciples to show who he is to those who don't know him. And it is getting more unpopular to do. Skipping on down to verse 20 through 22. We see Job's philosophy of life. And it's the philosophy that we need for today. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell down to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of Yahweh. Throughout all this, Job did not sin, nor blame God for anything. Job recognized that ultimately the Lord determines all things in his life. So he submitted himself to God's will. And in doing so, Job blessed the name of God and not blamed him. We got to have Christians and disciples today that are willing to bless the name of the Lord and not blame the Lord for what's going on in their lives. Those who don't point fingers but bend knees. Those who don't turn backs but puts their face on the ground. Those that are willing to praise God in the storm. Those that are willing to say, my Lord is in control and whatever he wants from me, he can have. I came into this world without, any, without anything. I will leave this world without anything. Everything is for God to use in my life. That's a tall order. How do you wrap your mind around that? By saying that we have a hedge of protection. And if Satan is attacking us, God is allowing it. And if God is allowing it, he has a purpose for it. And that purpose always leads to the glory of God. That's what we say. Going on down to chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we're talking about his health. Job failed at the first, or Satan failed at the first attempt. So he's asking God permission to touch him. If you just let me touch him, I'll turn him. So God gives him. You don't have any health, you don't have anything, right? We all have an Achilles heel. We believe that we have a limit, an uncle moment, and some buckle under the pressures of the testing and the trials. They falter because they don't think God's with them anymore or that God loves them anymore or God's not blessing them because of something that they have done. All kinds of doubts shake your relationship with them. But God is able and willing to sustain you for His glory. It's not about you. It's not about me. 
It's about God's glory and how much it shines through you. Does that make a lot of sense to you? We look at problems and we see things and we think that, oh Lord, why are you doing this to me? <clears throat> I'm not doing it to you. I'm doing it for my glory. Something that we should be willing to give. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Scripture says that God's got this. Scripture says that you may think it's an uncle moment, but it's really not. It's a refining moment. Instead of crumbling to it, we just need to strengthen our relationship to the fire of these tests. Because when you get to that other side, you're going to understand and strengthen your walk. Go on down to verses 7 and 8. The testing begins of his health boils, scraping him with broken pottery. With no human explanation, no reason to be tested like he's being tested. There's nothing that Job did to deserve this. He had a perfect walk. But I was reading this and I wonder, you know, it would be easier if God just came out and said, hey dude, yeah you, I'm going to test you. This is what you've got to go through. Yeah, it's going to be painful. Yeah, there's going to be sacrifice. But here's the end result. And I'm going to walk with you all the way and you're going to see a better life at the end result. That'd make it easier to walk that walk, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? If we're honest, wouldn't that be easier? If God just would let us in on the big picture? Amen. But that's not faith. And faith is a key element to your relationship with the Father. Hebrews 11 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Go on down to verse 6. It said, it is, not, it is impossible to please God without faith. Faith means that you believe in God and God is with you all the time. If Satan's testing you, then he's allowing it. And if he's allowing it, he has a purpose for it. And if he has a purpose for it, the end result is the glory of God in your life shining to all Amen. to see. Amen. That's faith. That's when we walk the tests and the trials and we count them all joy. James 1, 2. Not only do we just walk and grumble and grunt through them. We're up there praising God as we're going through them. Praising God's name and not blaming God's name. Accepting our role of being the pole to uphold the glory of God for all to see. Romans 8, 28 says all things happen for the good for those who believe in Jesus Christ. God's telling us I won't put more on you than you can bear. I'm in control. I've got this. You shine your glory because of the faith that you have in me. We will get you through the end and you will be better for it. But you're going to have to rely on the relationship that you have with him. That's what this whole series has been about. A true relationship. You have to understand that's your base. That's your foundation. If you don't build your faith on that relationship, if you don't have a strong prayer life, if you don't study God's word, if you don't give him his time and spend time with him every day, if you don't build that relationship with God, then there is nothing to draw from to praise God as you go through these trials and these temptations. Society is, well, you can see it. And there will be a time when you realize that you are in the spiritual warfare. That you're going to have to make a stand. But to do that, you're going to have to strive to strengthen your relationship with the Father. 
verses 9 and 10. Even his wife gave him bad advice, but Job held on to his integrity. Satan had permission to take all his love. He took them all but his wife. I wonder why. Well, scripture says, my wife has my heart in her hand. picture of that is the ribcage protects the heart. Your wife was made from the ribcage. Scripture also tells us that they're the weaker vessel. Peter said that, not me. Don't yell at me. And Satan uses every tool to get to you. When I was having a, when I was doing my ministry of interim pastoring, you would go into these churches and you would try to fix things. You're not there for a popularity contest, you're there for God's word. And you try to fix things. Well, bucking the system is not always the greatest thing. I'm hard-headed enough to get away with it. But when they see that they couldn't bend my will, because my will was entrenched in God's will, they would send their wives to sneak around and talk to my wife. You know, wouldn't it be great if we did this? But you have to really don't want it. But if you talk to him, maybe you change his mind. And my wife looked at him and said, well, you don't know my husband very well. He loves me. And I am dear in his heart. But he loves God more. And if God has got his mindset, I'm not going to change it. Nor will I try. I think that's a problem with the churches today. A lot of churches today is the pastor bends his ear either to a huge force that's in the church or to a wife that's really not following the walk. He'll bend his ear to keep peace. We need to make sure we understand that everything we do is spiritual warfare. Everything we do is a test and a trial. It's something to glorify God with. Third point is, what's important? How many of you ever played the Jenga game? You know what I'm talking about? The little wooden blocks that you stack together? That's a crazy game. The object of that game, okay, okay. The object of that game is to knock out blocks, but not make the tower fall. Well, Satan plays a game with that, but he wants it the other way. He knocks out support blocks. So the tower will fall. Everything that we count on in life is an illusion. Our relationship with God should come first. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the things that we depend upon. You know, I was once told this. An old, the Old Testament is the expectation of God. The New Testament is the realization of God. See God's hand in play. Everything that we do should be a glory to God. Now here's what I'm talking about. Satan, I'm going to go through eight things that Satan took away from Job that should have been support. The first thing he punched out of Job's life is that he took the material things away from him. He stripped him of his <coughs> material substance. Now we need things today. I'll try to hurry along. It's tough to preach to over those 40 some chapters. We need material things today. We depend on our car to get us to work, right? We, that car supports us to go to work. We depend on our job to pay our bills. We depend on our home to be our sanctuary from this crazy society. And some would say that I depend on the coffee pot every morning. Or Red Bull. For those who don't drink coffee. What happens if they're gone? What do we do then? Where's our support lie then? God permitted Satan to take out his loved ones. Knocks out another support block. Trying to get the building to fall. We need our loved ones. When I always had questions or something was on my mind, I always called my dad. I always like talking to my dad. My dad's gone. And you realize that loved ones don't last forever. 
You know what does last forever? Your relationship with the Father. The third thing that Satan knocked out was his health. Trying to defeat his relationship with God. Fourth thing is, Job lost the sympathy of his wife. Another support knocked out. Fifth thing, Job lost. Satan turned Job's friends against him. Some of us have really good friends that we like to talk to. You see them every day at work. And you say, hey, this is what's going on in my life today. You know what happened to me? What do you think about that? What are you doing? Satan took that away from me. Next, six, Job loses his sense of worth and the dignity of his own personality. He knocks out another support, hoping that Job would turn into a shoeshine Christian. One that would say that God doesn't love me or he wouldn't let this all happen to me. I must not be worth anything to God. If I serve God this way, and this is the way I'm being treated. I won't praise God. I'll grumble and complain about God. Because Satan is knocking out another support. Of course, Luke 12, 7, by the way, you can read that later, tells you that you are worth something. Seven, Job loses his sense of the justice of God. He can't even see that God is a just God anymore. That's what Satan was trying to take from him. If he could just see that God was a purpose and God of justice was a reason for him to go through these things that he was going through, it would give him courage. But Satan was taking that away from him. He wanted the glory of God to vanish from Job's life. He wanted the light to be extinguished. He wanted to make sure Job was not a place to go for encouragement about who God is, but discouragement. He wanted to turn him cynical and critical and sarcastic in his life. He wanted to make sure he left stains upon people that came to see him and not light of who God is. He wanted them to exclude failure and not hope. And eight, Satan kicks out another support. Job will, also, Job will also lose his sense of the love of God. God just don't care. He's not listening and he don't care. He forgot about me. So if he can forget about me, then I'll forget about him. Some of you may have walked or came across Christians in your path that tell you these things about how they were treated at a church. Or let me tell you what happened to me. And I've always heard that. That's always started. They just crumble when their support's <clears throat> gone. Down. You know what that means? That means their relationship was not a true one when it comes to serving the Father. Not understanding their role and who they are. And that God has total control of our lives. At the end of the journey, it is seen that God had Job's back. And he gets restored. Make no mistake, it took every ounce of that perfect relationship Job had with God to get him through what he went through. The question is, no relationship means that we're too weak to serve God. No relationship means our faith is not there and we can't walk a test because we will fail. No relationship means that we're not filling the Great Commission and we're not fulfilling the role of a disciple. We're not really showing the light of God in our dark times. My question for today, and we end this this way, how far would your relationship with God take you right now on a journey of tests and trials? How far, how much could you stay and continue to bless God? Bow your heads with me. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or if you're watching by video, you can change that. If your heart's calling upon you, 
All you need to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say that out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost, and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours, and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head still bowed, and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer to everybody in ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come here to Shyline Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. Tell us about that decision that you made so that we can help you with your walk. Maybe you're here today and you said that prayer. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to ask you three questions. Is there one that said that prayer today? Maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe you wonder that question about where your true relationship is with God. Are you spending time daily with Him? Are you in God's Word daily with Him? Are you in prayer with Him daily? Is your relationship one that you think of God during the day? And you're asking God to use you as a servant. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Society is going to try to turn us against the Father. It will no longer be popular to shine that light. But it is something that is our duty as disciples to do. Get ready for it by strengthening your relationship with whom you belong. All right, you may raise your head, stand as if you will. Very good.